Welcome back to another edition of Elevate Your Grind brought to you by the Cannabis Lab. I am your host, Todd Rosales, and welcome back to a whole new week of episodes of Elevate Your Grind. Folks, we've got some great episodes for you, like we always do. We're actually going to do, holy crap, I think we're doing four episodes this week. We've got an awesome one today. Tomorrow, we've got two great friends of mine, the founding ladies of Her Highness. I'm really excited to talk to them about their business. On Friday, we have the Florida team from AYR, so those representing Liberty Health Sciences. And then today, folks, if you're paying attention to our stats, we've had a little bit of a sub out. Jesse Elkins is not with us today. But when my friends over at Matteo Communications reached out to me and they said, hey, we know you have an open spot. We have a guest who will jump on and, and bullshit with you tonight. I said, well, I don't mm-hmm. want to be lonely, so send them over. Um, and here we are today. So, folks, you know what's coming up this week. Of course, check out all of our great episodes from last week. Find those at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. We had Emily Paxia. We had Mark Lopez. We had David Kessler from Agrify. It was a packed week of conversations. So youtube.com slash elevate your grind. You can find those there. All right. My guest today, in my opinion, has been training for this industry his entire life. Everything that he has done has led up to being in the cannabis space. I'm really excited to talk to him. I love this company because they are headquartered right here in my hometown in South Florida. So please welcome Andreas Newman, the chief creative officer of Juicy Holdings. Andreas, Dre, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Todd. What, what an introduction, man. Thanks for having well, me. Well, you know... I- I told you I was listening to to Kevin's interview from Cannabinoid Connect, as I do. And Kevin, thank you for being such a great source of information for me. But, you know, I I listened to your entire background of the things that you've done. And to me, you've always been very good at outside the box marketing, you know, not just you're down the middle advertising like I couldn't even compare yeah. you to Don Draper because Don Draper was pitching things <laughs> that were expected. You know, if you were Don Draper, you would have been painting the sides of buildings instead of coming out with, with different types of TV commercials. So, you know, I, I want to go back to the beginning and just kind of justify that statement. But experiential in this outside the box marketing is nothing new to you. You've been doing this your whole career, correct? Yeah, the thing is, you say it's funny you say outside the box because we've. I think we've gone even further in, in lots of projects. I did. We always said from the beginning, there's no box. There's not even a box there. You're seeing. So let's let's leave even the box uh, box away and 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 really really move. I, I always said, and I said it many times, move at the speed of inspiration or the speed of opportunity, right? And this is has been always my motto, kind of. Um, and so where this all starts really is like when I started my first company it was really like. Um, it was a little bit naive even, but the timing was right. And if I think back, if I think back today, would I do it again like that? Definitely not. But then I was so confident and had had no doubt and fearless, which you always have to be, I think. And I started my first company was 21. And then, uh, the phones didn't ring for months and everybody who I thought would call never called. And then out of the blue, the phone ring. This is 1990. You know, there's really a phone ringing, and you have one receptionist there, and she has a typewriter, and like, oh my god, the phone rings, and that was great Germany, like an American agency, this American uh, superstar creative director, the Don Draper of Germany, as I said, and he said, hey boy, I've got a film to do for. I have no money, but but it it will be it will be great. You should do it, and then. <laughs> <laughs> thing. If I have no money. You're perfect for it. Now, this is always because it's the first thing. I have no money. Yeah. They had a little bit of money, but I what I did, long story short, I, I really this was the this was the chance, and I threw everything into it. You know, all what I all I, I learned until then, all the money I had, and I threw everything into it. And and uh, they said they said, well, it's, we're never gonna use this. It was a Procter Gamble commercial or like a test commercial. You know, they 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 shoot those things, they called it quick and rough. And the quick and rough is never goes on air. So I said, what if I do it so good if you could actually use it? It tests so good you can use it. No, we're never going to do that anyway. So you can, you can try, but whatever. So I threw everything in. And the funny thing is I ended up as the main character in the commercial. Uh, the guy, the girl kisses in the end. This was an aftershave commercial. Uh, and long story short, that thing was the best testing commercial of all times of Procter & Gamble. And so then in, in the, in the uh, fragrance category, and um, 
the thing won an award in Cannes Film Festival. You couldn't you couldn't make this up. And that started basically my career and ending up in selling my company to Gray to an American agency. But then already I loved the Americans because this was the only this was really like a, a being in Germany. You know, like there's just the kind of the whole right. There's not the same spirit like here. Uh, when the Americans do something, they do it right. They might not be the first always like in, that. If they do it, they do it right and take it to another level. And that's what I appreciate so much. And so that that went on in my career. I then joined Gray and then I moved to from Germany to England and started various, various startups, always in the in the area of like um, like replacing traditional advertising, really, you know, finding other ways to advertise because you know online was so big in the early 90s or 90s already, and we had to find different ways. So so I was always on the forefront of that and started really like uh, branded entertainment, which is now, I mean, it's already, everybody's doing it, but looking at the cannabis industry, huh, this is another category, right? There's like, there's so much compliance things that you, you cannot really advertise. So you have to really find other ways to communicate with your patients and patients and customers. Yeah. So, so that's, as you said before, that's kind of made, was made for me. And the journey to there was really like, a, was, was, I think I was prepared all my life for this, for this journey. You know, that's really interesting that you say, you know, this guy told you, A, I, starting a business at 21, no matter, you know, what time, what decade, whatever it is, you've got to have some sort of level of confidence. Because I can tell you when I graduated college, I couldn't even fathom starting a business. Like I, I look back and I actually started a car wash business in college. And I remember once yeah. I made my money back, I got so freaking scared and, and just stopped. Right. Yeah. And, you know, I did the job and it wasn't until I started sitting down and speaking to folks like you that it gave me the confidence, but it's interesting. You bring up something that the guy said to you when you were doing this project. And I'm wondering if it's really what accelerated you because he said hey this is a, a, a we're going to shoot it rough and dirty it's going to test it's probably never going to see air so i feel like that kind of gave you the confidence to say like hey i can kind of have the freedom to do what i want in this video right. because it's right. not going on air who cares i'm just going to do things my way so i get the experience and because you had that freedom it's almost like free playing football when you know the defense is off sides you're going to yeah. throw the ball down the field because if they intercept it it doesn't matter right so because at the end of the day and i don't want to say there's no down there's always a downside but because the downside was small do yeah. you feel like that is really what excelled you to create a masterpiece which ended up being the opposite of everything he said it was going to be no yeah you're absolutely right first of all it's actually a good thing you had a limited budget and then if i i think about it like it's to, it was a total, as you say, creative liberation. And let's everything I'm doing or like we're doing here in, in a group is or we, let's make it as good as it can be. You know, there's no I, I've never I would never would do something. Okay, we only have that budget. Let's make it as the budget. I, you always you take the budget and then you the money has to go on the screen in the film business, right? And I see this in every in every industry. You know, your money has to go on the screen. It, has to, it doesn't have to go on airplane tickets or hotel bills or something. You, you have to put it. And this is a this is. This is this is creative, you know. This is creative producing and making stuff as good as they can be is is, is key, I think, in in every category. You know, I I feel like being a creative entrepreneur and, and nothing against entrepreneurs, but I feel like being a creative entrepreneur is, is harder than normal because at the end of the day, there are business models that exist and there are things yeah. that you can replicate. But when you're creative, sometimes you're you're coming up with ideas from scratch or from thin air, right? So to your point, right there you know, there might be a new commercial or a new way of doing things or just a new medium that you're trying that has never been done before because you think it's yeah. going to be effective. Like you said, there's no box. We're figuring out what's next. So yeah. I feel like it's almost harder. I love speaking with creatives that are business leaders because on paper, you shouldn't be there, right? Exactly. You, you should be exactly. in an art studio. You should be poor in, in LA in a studio, you know, trying to sell, your, trying to sell your art. You shouldn't be a business leader who people are coming to for thought processes. Have you always been creative or did you discover it once you got into the business world? What, what were you like when you were younger? Yeah. So, so I had a, I had, I, I was lucky that I, when I, when I, found out that I'm going to be in commercials. So commercials already is a different ball game than movies, right? Because until you make a movie, it takes a long time. You're never going to get a big budget as a young filmmaker. You, you have, a, a, have to have a lot of luck. It, doesn't, it didn't interest me. When, when I was the first time on a commercial set and I came in and saw alone the food those guys are having, uh, <laughs> I, said, I said, oh, wow, this is, I have to be, this is, this is like they have enough money to do this amazing stuff for 60 seconds. You know, spend more money in one day than a movie spends in like a week. So 
I had an advantage going in this category, the really like commercialists, or he says commercials, right? So uh, this was a big business. So my company took off and uh, I, was, I was in the beginning really a producer. So the guy who puts everybody together, so put the creatives together instead of doing it myself, because that, that meant for me, I'm not scalable, right? If I direct stuff myself, then okay, I can only do one movie or something. So I ended up having 25 producers and we did like 350 commercials a year. And it was amazing. So that was really a commercial. It was a business, you know, working for Procter & Gamble, Mars, uh, Unilever, uh, Apple, etc. So that was, it was a business, you know. So a training with like, with like directors like Ridley Scott or like Joe Pitka, or like Fincher, David Fincher, all these big guys, they all started in commercials. Anton Fugua, like all these guys started in commercials. Uh, and I was able to shoot with all this. I shot commercials with George Lucas. I hired Industrial Lights and Lights of Magic for his company for orange juice commercials, you know, and stuff. So imagine being having that amount of money to to and responsibility to work with those creatives where you can learn. It's like the best film school. I mean, I started in my 20s. So by the time I was 30, I was like, oh my God, like hundreds of millions of dollars like been gone down the down the school. <laughs> the best school ever right and then after 30 i really focused more on creativity but it ended it ended always up in in like new companies and new creative startups which have both you know you have to make money if you want to be creative I yeah. mean, no creativity without money uh i think oh. so, so it's no fun but i think it i think it's a different route that creatives don't look at because it you know is quote unquote the corporate world or the suit world where at the end of the day we're at a place now and, and probably I'd say more so in the last five years than, than ever before in history where company, every company has to be a media company, right? Because we have social media, because yeah, everything totally, is so visual totally. and we have these micro influencers and everything else that every company has to be a media company. I'm, you know, 100%. referencing the conversation you have with Kevin again, we talk about these big company kickoffs and, and conferences and everything else. And there are, small films being played throughout all these one that I you guys talked about the tech companies I was a very big Microsoft partner for a long time yeah, world yeah. partner conference was one I went to every yeah. year and Microsoft awesome. would have these beautiful short films that they yeah. would would make yeah. and I would imagine that somebody in high school that's interested in film or someone in film school wouldn't even imagine going to work for Microsoft to have creative freedom. They're probably trying to move out to Hollywood and compete for the same jobs that everybody else is competing for. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, uh, and that is, that is a challenge. We, uh, we know, um, this is like, this is true. So basically those companies as well, uh, the journey going, going, going away from really traditional advertising, it went into a lot into, uh, like, the events business, right? As you just said, like the events and then the films you have to show in the events and the content. Uh, I always said content is king. I mean, content is more king than ever now, right? And you yeah. have it around every 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 influencer has his own like has his own content bank and his own brand and its own like look and feel and the grid and it feels it. so it's amazing what people are doing now. Everybody is their own little brand. So uh, it's a uh, uh, that's why, for example, in Jushi, I'm calling our department the you could call it marketing department. I don't want to call it that. I would call it the creative department because the business, I think the business has, has deserved creativity more than, okay, let's market that stuff. Yes. You know, like more creativity. You have to find like uh, respectful, cool ways to, to communicate really. And that's, and that's what we do. And on digital, basically my, my group is doing digital retail and all the brands. So, so that's how we end with the creative, creative team. Definitely. I would definitely back you up. I think in, in the entire cannabis industry, specifically Juicy, you guys should be called the creative department because you go so far beyond marketing because traditional marketing, there's a lot of roadblocks for us. Okay. I want to I wanna call it a specific project because I'd love to, to, to dig into this a little bit more. You know, I, I would, you did, from what I understand, and, and I was kind of helping put my daughter to bed while I was listening to the podcast, so I didn't get the whole story, <laughs> but you um you got you were doing some advertising work for if I remember correctly it was an alcohol company and you guys ended up doing a a documentary yeah. on Brazil yeah, and you were great, able to get Pele great. into the documentary so now you have this alcohol company that has all these beautiful images of Brazil you have the most famous soccer player from Brazil and they have this footage that they can use now and as you said if you would have shot it as a commercial you wouldn't have been able to do the things that you do so when I say folks that he's the master of the outside the box thinking I mean how long ago was this that you're like well we can't do this as a commercial but if we do it as a documentary 
we can get more people. And then, oh, by the way, we don't have to pay for TV spots because we're going to give it to the TV channels and they're going to play it for us. I mean, right. that is genius. And this is two, uh, this is this is 2004, which is, I mean, sounds it's like a long time ago, but that was really on the forefront. At that time, I was in Saatchi and Saatchi. So I had my own. So basically, I, I moved my one of my startups in England. I sold that again, like the, I did with the 20s. I sold it to Saatchi and Saatchi, big a- agency network. Uh, worldwide network, as you, as you you you've probably heard of them, Sachi and Sachi, and they basically gave me my own and again creative studio, my branded entertainment department. So I had access to all the clients, and the clients all they were looking for new ways to communicate. And the idea was so the basically the the offering was like, are we doing a this is Brazilian client new new new. It's like in vodka, Cachaza, you know, it's a Cachaza line called Sagachiba. And they basically looked for the launch of Europe. Shall we do cinema commercials? Because cinema was the only place where you could still play alcohol commercials. So shall we do like this millions of dollars cinema commercial, 60 seconds with Ridley Scott, whatever, $10 million budget and then 80 million uh, media budget? Uh, or should we, and then... Uh, you know, it's like this, the, the most terrible thing with that, with content, right? Which doesn't, you have to pay for it to be seen. And if you don't yeah. pay anymore, it's gone. So let's create something which people actually want to see and actually would even, might even pay for seeing. Imagine, that's a radical yeah. change. So this is what I sold to the Brazilian entrepreneur, Marco, Marcos de Marais, who's a, who's a big Brazilian internet entrepreneur. He was, he was like, so he, he, had a, he had a great view on things and he started a brand himself. And, and we did that. So we, we did a documentary. We did a, a attached photo exhibition. We launched the, the film in the Cannes Film Festival. And then it went uh, on a barter deal, as you said, with CNBC. So we gave them the content for free and they played it um, and, and, and gave us even commercial time, which we, we shot the commercials the same time we were shooting the, the documentary on Brazil. It basically was a documentary on Brazil. The tagline of the brand was uh, the pure spirit of Brazil. So Sagachiba, the pure spirit of Brazil. And the documentary wow. was called, guess what? The Pure Spirit of Brazil. And I shot it with, um, with, a, with a big director. Fernando Marias was the producer, who is the director of City of God. You might have heard of that movie. It was uh, mm-hmm. uh, Oscar nominated. And was great Brazilian director. He did The Pope, The Two Popes as well, just there now. And so we shot that and we got, you know, all already on the way of doing it. We PR'd the shit out of it in every like place where we went. We went to Pelé and we, all the all the states in Brazil. We went and everywhere we went, we had a we had the PR machine turn on while we were shooting. So this 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 move this this already made money or got exposure while it's made. So I always said laughingly, you could we don't have to really release it because we got so much PR already while we were shooting it. You don't really have to release it. And to finish the story, fast forward like. I think I said this before, but it's like, it's, it's a fun, fun little detail. So content, we created that content. There was no freaking product in the film at all. So basically it's like, it's good forever that this stuff gets only better with the years. You know, it's a documentary in Brazil. We had Soy George in there, who is like the biggest, uh, biggest uh, living music artist of Brazil. He was narrating the film. So it's a, became a cultural piece really. And the thing is, so I'm going to Heathrow like uh, two years ago and there's a big stand of Sagachiba, like some, some ladies handing out samples on the airport in Heathrow of, of Sagachiba, the drink. And in the background, in the, in the, wall, of, in the wall, the company is long sold to Campari. Um, and I see my images on the wall. They're still using them, 10 years in. So imagine the, the value that got out of this Maybe we shot that whole thing and did all the parties and like the Cannes Film Festival for $5 million instead of spending like literally like $80 million. Um, so, amazing. So and, and, and see, this is why I love creatives in, in the business world, because not only did you come up with a creative advertisement, you also came up with a very creative way to do it. So, you know, the creativeness, and I think I'm overusing that word, is not just limited to the content that you're putting out, but how it's put out and how it's received. Because I, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are other people who have done things similar, but I've never heard a story like that where it's, you know, the closest thing, and, and it's a mutual friend of ours, Rosie Matteo was telling me like, hey, I can't buy advertising in the New York Times, but I sure can get them to write an article about us, right? Yeah. So here yeah. you are is I can't get these 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 people to be in this because of contract. You know, I'm sure Pele wasn't allowed to be around alcohol and things like that. And, you know, you've got press 
for your press. Essentially, you're making a very long commercial and you got commercials for it. That's oh, totally. I, I, to, totally. And to Pelé in it and, 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 and uh, Soy George in it, you normally you approach them. You want to be in a docu- you have to be in a documentary on, on Brazil. We're shooting a documentary on Brazil. It's sponsored by this, or so it's like financed by this al- new alcohol brand who's the owner is your friend, by the way. And he says, of course, I'll, I have to be in it. I mean, Pele has to be in a Brazilian documentary, right? So he's, he loved it. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and that w- worked out. I mean, this, this is real stuff, you know, and it's people like, see, like, this is actually real. Like, it was a real good documentary. You know, it's like, it's like nice, yeah. nice to watch and you learn about the country and, 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 and all the states and everything. So it was a beautiful thing on top of it. So it was good for Brazil, was good for the brand, was good for the business, good for everybody, win-win for everybody. <laughs> I think, I mean, to me, it sounds like a great project. So this is why I go back to, you know, when when my opening statement with you is you were bred for this industry because things like that is exactly how our industry has to advertise. You know, I I forget who's doing it right now. I don't even need to mention the name, but there's a limited series coming out on Netflix where it's like eight different independent episodes. And there was a company that came out with a package that has eight pre-rolls, one for every episode. And I see that being the future of not the future of advertising, we're just pairing it with media, but almost to a point, especially in this industry, where I wouldn't be shocked to see a limited series put out by Jushi or a movie or a short film put out by Jushi that may not have anything to do with the company itself, but that you guys are just involved with it, right? I mean, you're smiling and I'm hoping I'm not like (laughs) reviewing too much of your business plan here. No, exactly. You don't get more than the smile, but I'm really smiling here. I'm I'm telling you, this is, of of course, this is, this is exactly what this is about. You know, like it's like um, uh, branded entertainment at its best. You have to, today when you when you create entertainment, it has really well deserved that, that these things, culture, what's happening in culture now is can be integrated in, in, those, in, those, in, in that content. And of course, then it gets a relevant exposure instead of like, okay, I paid for this and it's there and nobody's interested. So there's like billboards or something. It's... It- if you, it's the it's old funny world, you, know, you have to be more sophisticated. Well, commercials can't be that effective anymore because right now we have cable companies and providers scrambling to figure out how to put exactly. commercials back into shows. We've all gotten so good at recording what we want to watch or streaming it on demand that now, like, so I signed up for at and TV and like almost any show they have on demand, if it's the current season, but you have to watch commercials. So they're like, Hey, you forgot to DVR it. Now you have to watch commercials. But I can tell you, I, I don't pay attention to them, you know, so I can't see that working, but how much do we pay attention to the content? Right. You, so, you know, you know, a masterpiece of this one example is with, uh, with Tom Hanks Castaway, And this is like where FedEx really invested in the movie, but imagine that meeting is kind of fun for the, for the guys to listen to. Imagine the meeting happening where the script <laughs> guys presenting to FedEx, the conservative board of FedEx, we're going to do this movie. You're going to pay $40 million for it. Tom, Tom Hanks is it. And he's on the island. The first thing in the first 15 minutes of the movie happens, your plane goes down and crashes. Uh, okay. <laughs> our yeah. FedEx plane is crashing in our movie. We're paying for So that's so. But then the movie has a big message, right? It's all about, then they had in their tagline, I think we always deliver. But if you, if you remember the movie in the end, Tom Hanks drives up this somewhere in the Midwest in this long road and he actually, he, he had on the island this, this, this package with him. He never opened it. And in the end, he's delivering it. And <laughs> what a, I get goosebumps now when I say it, right? It's like Im- highly emotional. And this is, imagine they put in the money, they get a commercial forever until the world goes down, the world explodes. This movie will be on and will always tell this nice story. Yeah. So this is, this is how you have to see it. And it's not like, it, it's not di- uh, disturbing, right? It's like, you, you enjoy it. It's real FedEx in it. And Wilson is where he always talks to Wilson. And Wilson mm-hmm. becomes his friend, the basketball, right? I mean, that's like uh, examples of that. That's how you do it, right? Like this is the, the best thing oh. you can. And I'm really take my hat off to the filmmakers and the, who pulled this off to sell it to FedEx. I love, I love that you bring it up that way because I love those hypotheticals, like just being mm-hmm. in the room for the pitch meeting, like sitting there like, okay, tell us about it. Well, it's a movie <laughs> about a guy stranded on an island and you guys are going to be the, the package delivery company associated. All right, well, what happens? Well, first the plane goes down. Mm. <laughs> then he's stuck on the island. Everybody mm. dies, by the way, beside him. Yeah, yeah. But he delivers the package at the end. <laughs> exactly. Okay. 
okay, we can see it's it's. But to your point, it, it's probably the best advertising that they have. So I mean, it's, it's endless. It's going on and on and on. Imagine, I mean, I mean, media budgets. You know, like today to get through. Even in the nineties, it was like when we when we launched Slim Fast in Europe. I mean, you're talking about hundred million dollars for starters, just the media. You know, the the, the yeah. commercial spots you're buying all over Europe. So that's that's. It, it, it's a different ball game and it's forever. So, and, and I feel relevant. like the, I feel like the opportunity for cannabis companies to start taking advantage of this is, is almost here or if not here. So, you know, I, I'll admit I'm a, I'm a comic book nerd. There's a show on the CW I like called legends of tomorrow. It's a DC comic show. And in the last episode I watched, they have this little computer on board, they're time travelers, whatever. Yeah, and yeah, it yeah. makes, makes any food or beverage that you want. And one of the guys on the team used it to make cannabis edibles. And there was like <laughs> literally five to 10 references of cannabis edibles on this TV show. That's not even designed for full adults. It's designed for teenagers and stuff. And yeah. here I am like, oh my God, a DC comics hero is on marijuana edibles. I never thought I'd see the day. So now, you know, going around it, having cannabis integrated into shows and feature films is really not as taboo as it's been, which is yeah. why like for someone like you, it's the perfect timing to be in this industry. Totally. Totally. And as of course, I mean, I, I, the, 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 the thought might've, might, might've crossed my mind. Might've crossed your mind. <laughs> so let's, let's talk about you coming to this industry because I love the story that you really weren't looking to get in this space. It just so happened that someone, you know, yeah. so between the, the filmmaking work and, and the, and the agencies and everything else. And for some reason, I feel like, you know, you meet people and then you just create your own jobs and these adjacent companies and everything else, which I love because that to me is an ideal career oh, yeah. path where you, even if you're working with a big company, but you're kind of like, you have your own department and your own thing and you're creating from scratch. You kind of get that entrepreneurial freedom where they're like, Hey, we hired you to do your job, do it. And we're fine. You know? Um, but you went and you kind of got yourself ingrained in the music world. And you were a photographer for all these famous musicians and some of my absolute favorites, one of them being Dave Grohl and the Foo Fighters. Mm -hmm. And I know Queens mm -hmm. of the stone age. And it was through those interactions that brought you into cannabis. Kind of a said, yeah. It's 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 such a it's such a funny story because so I can should I tell you a story quickly a little, a little bit like you how, you how can tell it, it as long as you want so the connection I know where to go so me too yeah perfect so where it all started so I'm I'm doing this um, I'm doing this album first of all uh, Josh Homme from Queens of Stone she always does this mixtape called Desert Sessions and so I was like pretty busy there's like 10, 10 big stars invited from Billy Gibbons to Les Claypool etc so lots of rock stars were coming together doing a, doing an album in the desert and I was shooting that and then uh, already crossed my mind like California is waking up to cannabis I always was dancing around the idea well oh, this is like we are talking about the stoner rock band now I'm in the desert again and the stoner rock and and that's stick in my mind. And then I'm going to my my friend's this, this artist friend studio, and I see this beautiful this beautiful pre roll package on the table, and ask him, "What is, what is this? What is this? Looks like cigarettes." And what is it? He's like, "It's my brand, Andreas." It's like, "What brand is it?" It's like pre rolls, pre rolls. Really, that looks really. I never knew this. It looks they can look so good, right? It was it's a brand called Master Leaf, and. Then I say, I don't, I, I'm not sure it's, it's released yet, but it's, it might be released, but it looked beautiful. And I was thinking, we ha now we have to do Queens of the Stone Age, Stoner Rock, we have to do our own brand. And from then on, I was like still, still shooting, like it was 10 artists that were shooting all over the place. And I was, I was flying to San Francisco. And, uh, you know, I lived in, in, in Silicon Valley before I had my tech startups and all that. So mm -hmm. in another, another life as well. So, uh, so I went up there. And uh, to shoot Lost Glass Claypool. And I was never, I shouldn't really go that day because it was the flooding and I couldn't, you couldn't really drive around. And as I am always, the more flooding, the more I have to go there. So this is always my thing, right? I have to, when there's a, somebody says you cannot go, it's flooding, then I have to go. So, have to go. <laughs> so I go up there and I'm driving to Silicon Valley and then towards try to find Glass Claypool, who from Primus, super, super cool rocker. And and then I'm think, get reminded. Ah, I know some people here, like in Silicon Valley, who like I have, let, let me call. Let me call my friend Trevor Healy from. He's now in Singapore. He knows always who is who is who is in that business. So I'm thinking about it. So I called him. He didn't answer. I left him a voice message on WhatsApp, and this guy never calls back normally. I saw like two two three days. He calls me back and tells me something. 
within two seconds, he leaves me a voice message and says, you got to call this company Jushi. You got to call the president. His name is Eric Mauf. CEO is Jim Cacioppo. They're great guys. And they, uh, you should talk to them. They're in the East Coast. They're just starting this retail and so on. So great. I'll call them. And then, so the next thing I know, we got in contact and, and the rest is history. We, 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 for me, the timing was perfect. I just left my other, my other startup, like a user experience startup, uh, not startup, mm -hmm. actually sold it, sold it to a French company. Um, uh, and, and I was ready to go for the next adventure. And this just showed up whilst I'm doing all this, this, this desert session record on top of it, that record now in this year's Grammys, we won the Grammy for best packaging. <laughs> so that turned into a Grammy. Uh, and and the, the relationship is weird Silicon Mary story leads to Jushi. And then we started a, a we kind of started dating for like for like half a year. We did a great research project on California retail, which of, of course, which got me even more interested because we learned so much about it. And then uh, learning about like the leaders like Jim, he's the CEO, Jim Cacioppo, he's he's really close to the plant as well, and hearing from him how this is bigger than just money. This is like, this is really about, about a new movement, about creativity and about building something really. Uh, Jim, Jim came from, came from banking as well. And like from, 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 from big hedge funds and stuff. So, uh, but he's very close to the, to the plant that there's not many, I think not many CEOs who like really understand the plant. Yeah. And that fascinated me as well. So I'm in last February, we became my, me and my team became part of Yushi. In February, and we we had a record straight into the pandemic, and the the lucky thing was we were very digital. So my team very digital, and we um, we were able to launch like the first like our for our retail chain Beyond Hello. We we started the online platform. We launched it on twenty seventh of April two thousand twenty, uh, and it from day one stuff happens which I've never seen before. You know, I've never been in a in a business like that. So basically, we entered that bubble, the cannabis bubble from the outside world, and since then. I'm just surprised every day what works here and what never would work outside because you're kind of in a place which is like no other. And yeah, I, I really, I really love it. I love the as well, like all the people. It's kind of this microcosm. You're entering a place where there's there's no Nielsen, there's headset, or there's no Shopify, yeah. there's Jane Industries. So it's its own little world. People coming from the outside, they have to understand this. So it's kind of weird to hard to understand. It's like this little bubble which creating and you have to support each other. The companies support each other. You have to you have to really be be um, be aligned with this with, with within and uh, as well. I think the 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 plant itself is such a creative creative inspiration, uh, which I compare really with music as well. You can compare it to this, it has an effect. Everyone else has a different effect, and it's like it's like music. It's like art in a way. So that was fascinating. It's super cool to be part of this industry. I mean. As no, you said, you, kind of you're per for you're, per you're perfect for this industry. I mean, you you fit in great here, and 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 it's funny you fit into this industry. I don't mean you specifically, but people fit into this industry by standing out, and that's what I love about it. Right? Again, going back to my conversation with Rosie earlier, is it's crazy. We've all come from other industries. We've all had other jobs. I've never made so many friends in a professional yeah. industry. I just yeah. really haven't the people that we come across. And like you said, we're in such a new space and there's, we have to create our own tools and our own ecosystems and everything else that there is such a, a so much room for collaboration here that it is fun. Like we all get to have fun. I want to kind of circle back to you starting with Jushi, right? Because, you know, I did gloss over your tech career and the things that you're doing with user experience and everything yeah. else, but you know, that's kind of the first step you took when you when you walk through the doors at Jushi. Like you said, you guys did a research project. So yeah. here we are, and I've been touting your creativity and the creative side of you. Yeah, great, but the great. first thing that you do when you walk through the door is, uh, yo, we need data, right? Now, obviously, I'm sure you didn't right. say it that way, but we need data. We need to look at the market. We need to figure this out. And, you know, I love there was a quote, you know, you, you're, you've been in a lot of articles recently, but you basically called your real your, your stores are real time data sources. And you know where I work. So I love that statement. But I think that is so forward thinking to say, hey, who are we marketing to? Let's figure that out. So, you know, was it the tech side of you that that driven you that drove you to data? Or was that just always important to you? Because if you're going to create something, you needed to know who you're creating it for. Yeah, that's a super, super question. 
So going back to, so my last, I think a galvanizing moment in my career was when I joined a company called Idean, uh, which is this Scandinavian founded uh, user experience company, which blew up when, when I joined, like we did, we did the American market. So from, from Silicon Valley to New York, it was, was very successful. I, I joined them in like, Four years ago, and then then we, we built it in the US to like to to, to get them great traction, and then sold it to a French company called Capgemini. And what what happened there is I really learned uh, I really learned the importance of not only the experience, but as well like to uh, do this. And they have an art in this. You know, the the research in in the user experience world where it's done to the top level is is, is purely observational research so you observe what's happening you observe the processes you would you would you're not like really asking people their opinions it's more like observing flows and things and and mm-hmm. and, and and then you take that data and then you design your whatever it is based on that and that takes out you know if you ever have built an app and you have you you go you go for dinner and then you talk with some people about the app and then everybody has a freaking opinion on it and you should do this and you should add that and you should add this and this should do this. And my first startup I did in the tech industry, I did exactly that. I didn't have really strong UX this like long, long time before in Silicon Valley. And we, we didn't take that serious. And then we built basically a Frankenstein because every day I have a new idea and I wanted to, to go into this thing. And then every developer would always say, oh yeah, I can, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah. Uh, can we have like people like logging in and they can do the same time, make coffee and they, oh yeah, I can do that. And then it becomes this Frankenstein you cannot use. It can do everything, but you cannot use it. So this is a key moment for me was like, I understood that the experience and even where I come from, like with the branding and advertising, when you say now the brand equals the experience, this is basically my starting point. Yes. So, so, and that is always, always comes the research first. And in that, uh, and, and I have people like uh, in, in Jewish, we, we hired like great people like Julian Scarf, my longtime collaborator. He's a professor for user experience in the art center in, in, in Pasadena, one of the greatest universities for that. And so we approach every problem. First, we do the, first we do the research uh, and then we create and then we test and we create, we test. And it's not based on my opinion. I have brands uh, uh, in Jewish, so we have we done brands where I personally don't like the name. Um, I challenge it. Let's test it again. And then it comes out, everybody likes it. Everybody likes it. You cannot, you cannot fight it. So I have to go with the consumer. I don't have to go with my ego. Or I know everything. So I love this. This really puts your mind to rest. You know, like when you, when you, when you just, your concept is to rely on the data. And you can see it with one of our brands, for example, the bank, which uh, we relaunched in Nevada. In Nevada, we don't have any stores. We have a, we have a, a, a cultivation facility. We, we make flower uh, bank is a, is a flower brand and we launched it in Nevada. And in some categories, it out of the gate, this because of the, I think because of the packaging, because how it was, we, we tested this to pieces and it went straight to number one in some categories, a best-selling flower price point and design. And it looks the right way. It feels the right way, et cetera. And so, um, and that's, that's the success, which is really fun because it's, it's really based on a method, right? And I think only like only like that you can scale. You cannot depend on my this great guy has another great idea. Like it has to be scalable. And creating processes and even in the pre- creative department, process, process, process. And you can use enough space for creativity. You know, uh, it's but it's it has to be it has to be based on data. And then going to the stores, it's it's I mean in the beginning when we start, of course, you know, it's very analog. You go in, people just go in, they buy something, they cannot even leave their phone number because of compliance reasons. And then slowly when we introduced like our partners, Jane, we could get the, the cell phone numbers with them with them signing off on it, et cetera. And then you're starting to collect really a body of like like your your fans and your your community, you have them, and then you can communicate with them. So in Pennsylvania alone, we have like over 100,000 people we can communicate with. You know, we do our research with those people. We give them... Uh, when, when they give us their opinions, they, they get like 10% off or something. So it's good for both. And it's like even a promotional tool, et cetera, et cetera. But we get so much information and we process this and we have the right people to actually process that information and translate it into action. So scalability only possible with that kind of thing. It's in every age. We, every agency in the world, advertising agency has a process, right? So there's a Saatchi way with the love marks. There's a great way with the pyramid. So otherwise you could never scale. You know, you cannot depend on yeah. one freaking guy to okay he's the genius and he he knows everything so that's, Dre, that's i think 
That's how we write I, it. I think you're you're in a different area of cannabis marketing than I would say the majority of the brands in, in the country, right? You know, again, you know what I do for a living and I work with a lot of different brands, not nearly to the depths that you are, but there are still a lot of brands out there. I would say majority of them when they're up and coming, they just advertise the fact that they have the best product. Like, I don't yeah. even care if you have the best product. It's still not the, that's not the way to advertising. And I always, you know, when we had a lot of the regulations around 10 DLC and everything else, and we had to do clean images, I said, this is an opportunity for you to start doing lifestyle ads and things like exactly. that, where it's exactly what am I doing with your product? Who am I with? Where am I? What am I doing? Am I at a concert? Am I on a hike? Am I relaxing with friends? You know, am I going to the movies? Am I at a comedy yeah. show? And it was crazy to me that there were so many brands that were so they didn't want to relinquish the pictures of their nugs and their products and everything else. I'm like, yes, we need, we need people to know what to look for when they go into the store, but that's not going to evoke feeling out of people. And I think you're so far past that you're so far beyond even my knowledge of, of this industry and the marketing Thank that it, it's, it, no, it, I commend you because there aren't too many people that I get to talk to there at that level. Right. You know, it's funny to me when I talk to a lot of CMOs or, or people who have that title in this, in this, in this industry. And I'm like, in my head, and maybe it's the imposter syndrome I have, I'm like, I shouldn't know as much as you do. Like, I don't mm -hmm. know why I just shouldn't. And mm -hmm. it's funny because we see so many people like yourself that come from these big marketing backgrounds and these advertising backgrounds that believe that they can come here and, you know, crush it but then they get slapped in the face by all the restrictions here and just you know that's why i say you were bred for this industry because you come in you're like oh i've seen this before yeah we can do yeah. this we can do this and you know coming from the entertainment industry as well and doing albums and 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 and, and music projects and film projects and movies you can only ever i mean you have to make it great and people have to love it you know and you have to make something people love uh, and that's how, when, you, when you translate this into like uh, advertising, this is how this is what you have to do. You have to make th things people love, and and in cannabis, even more because there's so many restrictions. But it's such a, to be honest, it's such a the, the people are so great in this industry. I think is they they good people, and the patients and the customers are they good people, and they 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 appreciate it. You know, they really appreciate. It. An example, delivery, right? We have people oh. coming from. We have people coming from. We hire people from DoorDash or from Uber Eats who like create our delivery, best in class delivery. Uh, and when they come in, they would say, they would say, wow, like, okay, um, they would really freak out. They couldn't deliver like in within 20 minutes. And then uh, because they're thinking like outside the bubble, they're thinking yeah. like somebody is going to call, complain, the hamburger is not hot enough and I'm not going to pay. In yeah. cannabis, you come two hours late, you deliver two hours late. They all been like, hey, man, thanks for, <laughs> thanks yeah. for doing it. You, know, you want a tea, cup of tea? So that's, that's kind of, you think that's so beautiful to see. You know, it's not so, it's not so brutal yet. You know, yeah, it's yet to come. But I think in, in general, like the consumer is a little bit more mellow and a little bit more like, yeah, mellow is a good word. I think and not, no, not so. I, I I feel like the cannabis community is, we're just that we're this community and we have this secret thing, which is our cannabis. And we all know that it's beneficial to us and we enjoy yeah. it. And we have all our different uses. So like when it comes to the industry, I think most of us are just supportive of it where it's like, you know what, you're two hours late, but you're also delivering me cannabis. Like, yeah, so that's, exactly. that's great. Exactly. You know, I, Listen, those of us that used to buy in the black market, those guys were never on time. So, you know, I, at least <laughs> so you now happy when you little, showed up. Yeah. At least now they're giving me a delivery window, but that, that really kind of talks to another project that you started when you first got there is you looked at the website and you're like, we got to change this. And, and I'm making the assumptions here. This is going back to the, you know, the reenactment yep. of it. And they're like, you know, Hey, Dre, we, we're getting some hits on the website. It's doing its job. Yeah. Yeah. We need to change this. And then all of a sudden, March, 2020 comes, the world shuts and you're like, told you, you know, obviously I, yeah, I, I'm making a caricature there, but I, to it me, it was a great timing. It was a great timing. It was a, it, the thing is, I've you always know, been told the website is your storefront, and that should be a, just as nice as your retail location. That's our biggest it's store. Nice. Say. So, and then your goal was to take the friction out of this process, which I commend you because buying cannabis is, oh, like I said, going back to the black market days, buying cannabis has always had a friction on it. So to have someone like you taking the friction out of the process, I think that's going to be revolutionary. Yeah. And I, when I say going to be, you've done this already and you've already proved it. 
And this is all data, you know, when we, the thing is when, when Jushi, Jushi, is, Jushi is first really, uh, um, say always retail first, uh, started with Beyond Hello as a, as a, as a acquisition in Pennsylvania, there was only three stores, right? And there was obviously we inherited the brand, we inherited the website, but the interesting thing is looking at the website data, at uh, the analytics, you could see, of course, exactly where the people go, what they do and what they looking for and where they're clicking. So then when you analyze this again, you do some more research. It's a process research. Then you design your screens, then you test them again, and then you implement them. And this is what we did. And we just created a friction, friction, least frictionless like uh, pre-ordering platform, which people in a medical market specifically super appreciate because they can be sure that they get their medicine on time. That's going to be there for them. It's going to be already pre-packed. Then on top of COVID, it's at least touch points as possible. So that helped all, of course, to powering the online. But I'm telling you, it's still growing. And, and, and from another point of view, you're saying like the creative and the business. I mean, if you... If you're like a leader, like like Jim, and he's hiring a hiring a, a creative a creative director, chief creative officer, chief creative, uh, then at first you might expect that okay, great, make nice pictures and nice nice brands and all that. But I know that it's it's really you have to show the money, show me the money, you know. Yeah. And there was an opportunity there, you know. And, and I look, we looked around, we analyzed all the platforms out there, and there you can make it, you could make a big impact with the team we have and like doing that frictionless just to the menu shop now shop online and, and giving them a good experience really working working close with uh, with jane and they've been super helpful to kind of customize what we wanted to achieve and and in very close relationship there and it, it worked out perfectly and you know the day one and i've never seen this with no promotion just for, for traffic day one was over thirty thousand dollars revenue wow. which is i've never seen now it's in the hundred thousands every day, right? Because of course we have more stores, but it's like yeah, yeah. There's, there's days you have half a million, you have like six hundred thousand dollars on Friday, seven hundred thousand dollars a day online, which is it's like oh beyond hundred million dollar run rate, right? And on online, so it's like a big part of our business, uh, and of course all the and then you, all the data you're getting, and all the recommend recommendations. So it's kind of a snowball; it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You know? So so. Uh, very challenging, uh, by the way, in uh, in California. Um, so that, yeah. that that's a different story. But there, you need delivery, and you need like California markets is so far ahead of the game, and you have to and retrain. But in, in in markets where we start out and we just lay the lay the groundwork, like in Virginia, we are started mm-hmm. from scratch with the kind of in our health sector, we are the only ones. We have now I see up to seventy percent online again, uh, which is yeah. amazing. You know, this is like this is. This is this works in, in the medical market specifically, but then as well in Illinois, it's like another. It's like there's, there's as well a medical turned recreational. While we're there, works as well. California more challenging, but as I said, delivery is key here. So we're starting to launch more delivery stuff here in California when we when we build our footprint. So it's interesting because I um I feel that way about cannabis, right? I feel like you know, everyone's going to have their first experience in the store. When I say that is you're going to go into the store to find out what's new, to see the new stuff, to just kind of look at the spread again. Yes, you can look at the menu, but it's a completely different experience when you go there and you bullshit with the bud tender and like there are other people there you can talk to and everything else. But once you know what you want, you're going to get it delivered because it's easier and it's more convenient and you know yeah. what you want. Right. Yeah. But that yeah. doesn't mean you're never going to go back into the store. And and I saw you, you quoted, you, you said something where, you know, you think the stores of the future is really going to kind of be like a place where you can go and hang out and associate yeah. with like-minded people. Yeah. I fully agree with that. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, on-site consumption lounges and in, in the full Monty there, probably in Nevada, it will be, but that's, exactly how i like to experience cannabis it's like oh i haven't tried this brand or this this retailer yet let me go there let me check it out let me talk to their bud tenders let me get the experience and then once i know what i want i'm ordering it and i'm ordering it until i get to a point where i'm like "Ah, i'd love to see what's new or maybe i get a text message or an email that tells me there's something new so you know I, i know i kind of took your story and your thunder there but i i just I love the way that you look at that. So now that we're staring down the tail end of the pandemic, it looks like we're getting out of this thing, right? People are vaccinated, all that great stuff. How do you look at the stores? And I feel like you've started doing this or did this already. How do you reimagine the stores now that they're going to start 
having full loads of customers in them again. And, you know, retail is going to be a totally. thing. Yes. So first of all, our, so we, we really worked hard in the pandemic already on our store designs, right? So the next generation, we already worked like all year, obviously in, in, in the pandemic, we worked already in post pandemic store design. So we know it's, it's going to come back and it's going to come back probably even harder because like I call it the roaring twenties are coming, right? So like everybody is like, it's like payback time even like, so you want to go out, you want to enjoy stuff. You want to meet people. You want to see stuff even more than before. So our stores, first of all, they designed uh, like super cool, like, like a, like a Starbucks reserve, even like, you know, it's inspired by the, by the, where it is. Like if it's in Santa Barbara or if it's in Illinois, it's like, it's always, we take inspiration from the, from the environment in terms of art, what we put in the stores. Uh, but as well, what we do now, I call it like we create, trying to create this retail scene. So you would, you, we would feature pro, uh, products which have nothing to do with cannabis. Uh, and we do partnerships with smaller companies, you know, companies who maybe have been battled in the pandemic as well, but small companies, startups. Yeah. Uh, we have our like own candle line, for example, uh, with, a, with a very small company from Joshua Tree. We carry this whole spirit in our stores, you know, and it's like, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a whole candle line we've created. So that's selling. And our new collaboration would be a super fun one. We, we, we joined forces with Colin Hanks, uh, this, uh, Tom Hanks' son. Very and cool. he, has his, he has his own bandana line. It's called Hanks Kachives. And the Hanks Kachives, uh, we, we, we are starting features those in the stores we can. So we, I think we start with Illinois and we, start, uh, we, will, we will have that online as well. And it's just, you know, we might, might make it part of our uniforms in the stores. So it's like bandana. So that takes basically, takes it to the next, next level. It's a little bit like you could see like a Fred Siegel concept where, yeah. you know, it's an LA store where you, a, a, a store. My mother's you, favorite store in the world. Exactly. Where you feature stuff, which is, which is limited, which is about to take off and go mainstream. So we want to catch that things before they go mainstream, show them and have little, maybe we do in Palm Springs, for example, we just, we just got an, building a new store there that's, that's going to be our desert inspired rock and roll guitars on the wall and we bring our friends that's there and cool. like you know like selling vinyls uh, i think you know the, the other day i had a conversation a good example is like to to compare it a little bit with starbucks you know it's like a because the concept is like a you hang out there and not necessarily you want to uh you don't have to have a consumption launch you launch you, you just you just maybe have a cafe outside where you just hang and chat yeah. you know and, and then you go in but you don't necessarily have to smoke it. but we will do consumption lounges as well but it's uh it's more than that you know it's like become part of normality really and like take take that that stigma away and i think that will help and educate and education is so important and i think by having those stores on that level uh dark wood brushed metal super led lighting projections uh, well, it's, it, it's, it feels right. It doesn't feel scary. It's, it's, it's even by walking in there, it's like an education. Well, this cannot be wrong. This business is kind of, I'm not doing something wrong here. It's actually solid. Yeah. It's real. It's not like there's a GI, GI John standing in front of the bulletproof vest in front of the thing. <laughs> let's you, which you know, that experience is, is still there, uh, mainly, right? Because you have like security. So we brought our security, for example, We're working very hard already during pandemic to bring security in house because it's kind of the first thing you meet the first first person yeah. you meet is a security guard so they have to be part of our messaging they have to understand our brand and they cannot be sent by some security company every day and they have never heard of this they just come there with their gun and stand yeah. there so this is all those little things you have to work on it's a lot of things to do but um um it's that's that's the exciting thing you know it's like it's the exciting stuff in the cannabis industry you can basically shape and shape a world here which is i mean no, unheard of right I, I i the fact that you're bringing in regular products non-cannabis products not even cbd or anything else that are just kind of in the cannabis atmosphere whether it's the the hanks kerchiefs or the, yeah. the you know the vinyl or, or anything else like that to me that's you're 100 right that's the way that we help fight the stigma by and not just going there to get my cannabis like i can go there you with cannabis in an album or hang out yeah. and talk music with exactly. people or anything else exactly. and you know to see people breaking the stigma down that way that's exactly what we need um i was talking to gary santo of tilt and i'm like i'd be curious to see if we're going to start seeing different concepts for dispensaries in the future mm -hmm. whereas like you know, so I bring the example of beverages like can and my friends at House of Saka, yeah. where yeah. it's like 
those are harder to sell in a, in a place that sells a lot of flour and concentrates when you're selling to cannabis consumers. But if you can put it in the, in the aisles of an ABC liquor or something like that, I guarantee it would fly off the shelves. So how do we do that when the regulations aren't there? So I'm curious to know, like, will there be dispensaries of the future? Like this is one that's focused on edibles. This is one that's focused on drinks. This is a flower one, right? And where it is, and, you know, maybe the one that that's focused on drinks has a different type of atmosphere, you know, or, and it's more like a bar and it kind of brings that. So, you know, you guys are already taking that first step in that direction. And, you know, I, I, I've been a fan of the company. Like I said, you guys are here in Boca. You've got some gems in the organization. I've, I've, I'm friends with, with Todd Green and Toby Leibowitz and Mike Perlman's yes. been on the show. So, you know, I, you guys have a fan in me. I, the only thing I hate is that the only thing you have in Florida is your corporate office and none of your stores. So yeah. other than that, I love everything about you guys. <laughs> We're working on it. So, but it, yeah, it's, yeah, I, yeah. It's, it's been quite, it's been quite something like uh, so far. And uh, the, what are you saying? Like with that, with the store concepts, where this go with 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 drinks and everything? I think that comes a little bit later when the when when the baseline is set. You know, then you can yeah. start to jazz around it, and then you can like focus on the drinks. And there's people will come up with like, okay, this is only like then they then they do like live cook cookouts, and they have like fresh sweet juice bars and, and with infusions. And so this is all stuff we want to do. We we will focus in, in in the near future already experimenting on that stuff online. So we will have some concepts going with like with like uh, culinary concepts, you know, where we do cookouts and 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 show show and, and even yoga stuff, you know, very lifestyle-y. So yoga cookouts, like inviting people to 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 come together, join, cook together, etc. We're going to feature that in our social media first and see how this is going. But this is then all that stuff goes into the store concepts at some point, right? This is like all only there for that so yeah and that's no secret i mean it's like it's always good to have the ideas but the execution is is uh is key right and that's more difficult yeah. than having the idea of telling you that <laughs> specifically in this in this environment for sure great well, i've had a blast with this conversation i know there's a lot more that i want to talk to you about but i'm gonna hold it because you might have to come to boca raton at some point in time so the i next was just there like here. if i would have known i was just there like um well Last week, damn! I just missed you. Well, next time no, you're I'm, in town, obviously I'm always coming. Next time you're in town, let's do this in person. I think it'll be a no, lot okay. of fun, and it will be great. We can do it. Spring people we'll do it. I'd rather do it at the Juicy Office actually, but we'll do it at the office somewhere, or even maybe on the water somewhere. That'd be cool. I'll start thinking about that. I started to get the Everyone. bug once I started doing this podcast. I'm like, what else can I film? What else can I make? So like, I kind of <laughs> see the beginning of your journey there. Exactly. Um, no, no. Yeah, I know it. It's, I mean, this is it's all there it's all there for the taking right like all you need yeah. that's what I, maybe the last thing i want to say it's important that you can that, do that shit yourself as well right so i can actually shoot it as well if i need to right like this is important i think for everybody out there like you have to be able to do something and not like just talking yeah. so if, if the director leaves i finish the movie myself so that's, <laughs> that was but it's fun it's fun exactly. so Exactly. All right. Before I let you go, is there anything you want to plug? Website, social media, anything else like that? Yeah, obviously all our all our great brands. We have got uh, the Bank Flower is is out in Nevada. It's doing very well. It's, it's out in Pennsylvania, and then we have the Lab, our our concentrate brand brand concentrates brand, and we have a very cool one, Sachet. Um, Sachet is like the pre ground uh, line. It's 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 basically. It, it's the ideal product for the for the adventure it's like has kind of as well this feel of adventure and hiking and outdoors and surfing and log fires it's like this this cool very cost effective pre-ground line which flies off the shelves in pennsylvania and up and coming tasteology our edibles brand which we're launching in virginia very soon uh which will be super exciting because we're the only ones, I mean, I think with this kind of level of packaging, California level, our creative studio is here in California. And so we, we're learning from here. So that's, that's going to be a great, great fun in, in Ohio and in, uh, in, in Virginia. So. 
very cool man well my first experience with jushi will be for mj bizcon in nevada because i'm going to make sure i get oh, yeah. some big flower i might have to fly out early to get it with everybody else being in town for the show but definitely excited to try you guys in nevada and, and anywhere else i go really want to get the full retail experience like i said i have fear of missing out because I'm, I'm the only thing i have to enjoy here is your corporate office not any of the fun stuff so uh, we'll have to do this again for sure pretty fun so any anytime man thank you so much for having me Absolutely. And thank you to Dre and thank you to everybody at home for watching another episode, folks. If you missed any part of this episode, it'll be live on our YouTube page next Monday at youtube.com slash elevate your grind. Um, of course, we are live again tomorrow with the co-founders of Her Highness. That's right here at facebook.com slash cannabis group or at linkedin.com slash cannabis lab. You can find us live tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern at either of those folks. It's been another episode of Elevate Your Grind. We'll see you tomorrow.